I think we're going to get started as we have an exciting um, agenda plan for today. So officially, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, welcome. Here today, we're gathered on this beautiful sunny day in Kalamazoo for the opening day of the sixth annual Kalamazoo Food Waste Symposium. So this event is a collaboration between Kalamazoo Valley Museum and the Bronson Healthy Living Campus of Kalamazoo Valley Community College. So what is the Kalamazoo Food Waste Symposium? We created a heart statement when we first started this event. And the best way to describe it is that it inspires and empowers greater Kalamazoo communities to honor our agricultural history and heritage cuisines, celebrate good food, and work together to build a just and healthy future for all. So every year we have a different theme. And this year, in alignment with the exhibition of Wonder Media, Ask the Questions at Kalamazoo Valley Museum, we're exploring and celebrating food waste in the context of food and media. We're opening the event with this virtual keynote address today and continuing on April 15th with an outdoor celebration at the Food Innovation Center. This celebration will feature live music, food vendors, a seed swap, food photography workshop, activities for children, foraging walks, free bike tune-ups, and so much more. This is all free and it's family friendly. It's just an opportunity to gather in person and celebrate the rich food culture in Kalamazoo. So for Saturday's full schedule, visit our website, which is kalamazoofoodways.org. And we'll put that in the chat box as well. So my name is Christina Petrovska and joining me on our team is Rachel Bayer. We will be your hosts today and we're here to provide technical support as needed. But that brings me to today's keynote session. So I'm so honored to be welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Emily Contua, for a conversation on food and media, forging past, present, and future connections. Dr. Contua is a scholar, writer, and a teacher whose research explores the connections between food, the body, health, and identities in contemporary US media and popular culture. She's the author of Diners, uh, Dudes, and Diets, and uh, how gender and power collide in food, media, and culture, and co-editor of Food Instagram, Identity, Influence, and Negotiation. As an expert on a wide range of food topics, she's, she's written for NBC News, Culture Study, and Nursing Clio, been on podcasts like Gastropod, Extra Spicy, BBC Food Chain, and Food Psych, and appeared on CBS This Morning, BBC Ideas, and an Ugly Delicious with Chef David Chang on Netflix. She holds a PhD in an, and an MA in American Studies from Brown University, as well as an MLA in Gastronomy from Boston University, and an MPH in Public Health Nutrition from University of California, California Berkeley. She's Assistant Professor of Media Studies at the University of Tulsa. Welcome, Emily. With us today to facilitate this exciting conversation is Sue Ellen Christian. Sue Ellen is the 2021-2024 Presidential Innovation Professor in Communication at Western Michigan University. She's the author of Overcoming Bias, A Journalist's Guide to Culture and Context, and Everyday Media, An Analog Guide to Your Digital Life. A former award-winning staff writer for the Chicago Tribune, Christian is the recipient of many teaching awards, including the 2016 Michigan Professor of the Year. She teaches courses in multimedia journalism and media literacy, and news literacy at Western Michigan University. She's the creator and curator of the current exhibition at the Kalamazoo Valley Museum entitled Wonder Media, Ask the Questions, a 14 element interactive exhibition at the museum through 2023. This is the exhibition that inspired this year's Food Waste Symposium theme. Her current project involves converting the exhibition elements to an all digital format for use in public libraries. So without further ado, Dr. Kantu and Sue Ellen, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We're so happy to have you here, um, Emily. And thank you so much for um, inviting us KVCC Food Waste Symposium. Um, Dr. Kantu, if you could set uh, the scene for us in terms of why, um, Food is 
and actual media. Can you talk a little bit about food as media and how it has infiltrated our culture and history? Absolutely. So as a media studies professor now, right, we get asked to define our field, right? What the heck is media? And I think I'm lucky where I landed that the way we think about media is uh, broad and sort of revolutionary. We're not thinking just about radio, television, internet, right? Um, these typical media forms that a student might expect to study um, if they were going into media or communication. Um, that I myself and then my colleagues here at the University of Tulsa think about media as everything that connects humanity, right? That it has this social component that's about relationships and connections and the transformations that can happen when we form connections. Um, they're not always good or pleasurable, but they can be, right? they can be transformative and so important. Uh, this way of thinking about media more broadly, right, has this like aesthetic dimension. Um, food, right, engages all of our senses, not just taste, right? When I teach food media, my students are always so excited. We get to eat in class, um, that we have tasting sessions where we learn how to really critically use all of our senses to not just gulp it down and decide, did we like this or not? But to go more slowly, right, to develop those skills. And then thinking about the various technologies that intervene in our food, um, in its production, and how it's distributed, and how it's represented. And so there are, of course, these various food media forms, right? You can see, you know, in the uh, bookshelves behind me, right? Cookbooks, right? The representation of recipes, um, you know, all sorts of print phenomena that we think of as medium um, and as food media. Um, we go all the way to the digital world, right? Of tweets and TikToks and Instagram posts, but food itself, right, is also a medium in the way that it connects us, in the way that it nourishes us, in the way it opens up opportunities um, for thinking through, like, what the heck is mediation, right, this process of how information comes to us. Um, and so to think about food in that foundational way um, helps us to think more critically about the entire food chain, right, that it gives us a way of thinking about soil and seeds and heritage and tradition, as well as recipes and flavors, um, and then all these myriad ways, right, that we then try to communicate that to others. Wonderful. It's, in reading both of your, your books, um, Diners, Dudes, and Diets is, is one of uh, Dr. Contoy's books, and then um, her edited um, compilation called Food Instagram, Identity, Influence, and Negotiation, and both really opened my eyes to all the different ways that food intersects our culture, not just recipes, um, but certainly our history. Um, it's very gendered. That's a really interesting area that I want to delve into. But um, I do want to acknowledge that in our audience today, we and participants, I should call you all, you're not just an audience. Uh, we really want to hear from you. And the Q&A is open and feel free to drop in any questions at any time. Yes, absolutely. And I will definitely uh, make sure that we get those um, asked and hopefully answered in full. Um, we have folks here uh, who are food lovers, food researchers, nutritionists, food marketers, uh, food bloggers, and food lovers. So, um, one thing I would love to do just to kick off the conversation with our um, all of us together is to put up, if we could, please, uh, Christina, um, the first question, when you hear food media, which of the following comes to mind most? And um, we're going to invite you all to please answer this question to get a sense of how we're thinking about food and media and what that means to you. Oh, I love this question. I don't know about you with your students, um, but when I ask them, you know, what they think media is, they often immediately think first to digital media, right? They're thinking with their smartphones and they would be, right, sort of in the social media space, right? When they come to us, that's what they're thinking media is. Um, and so I'd be interested how our audience is thinking um, of most, right? When you think of what food media is, it'll be really fascinating to see um, where we land. I think we've got some great diversity in the audience different ages, different perspectives, different ways into food. Um, can't wait to see how this turns out. 
Dr. Contoy, while, while we're waiting for the, the poll to come through, can you talk a little bit about how you entered this field of research? Was there a, a moment or a, a dispute or a challenge or something that really crystallized for you your decision to research this area? Yeah, I actually write about this in the introduction to Diners, Dudes, and Diets and sort of the, the preface to that, um, that my mom, you know, always cooked, you know, when I was growing up, she really took it seriously to have a healthy, lovely dinner on the table every night. But I often reflected on what happened at Thanksgiving, that she and my grandmother, you know, would be in the kitchen working all day, right? This might reflect lots of our families, the uh, food work and food labor and food love is a part of putting, you know, special meals on the table. Um, and so my grandmother, right, participated in all of that. But then when we would sit down around the table, um, she didn't partake, right, in that bounty and in that beautiful meal. Um, she would have a lean cuisine meal. Uh, that my grandmother um, lived and struggled with an eating disorder for much of her life. Um, and elements of my own story are like that. I, you know, trained to be a professional ballet dancer from the time I was a little girl. And there are, you know, really strict sort of expectations for what your body looks like um, to be in ballet. And so I knew from early on that food could be pleasurable and beautiful, um, you know, sensorily, right? Like my mother always, you know, a beautiful plate, right? With, you know, gorgeous colors, right, for any of our culinary folks in the audience, right, that food can be beautiful for all of our senses. But I also knew, right, it could bring us together, and it was heritage, and it was history, and all these wonderful things. But it was also a source of tension, of anxiety, of paradoxes. And so I've been interested as a scholar to tease both sides, right, of our relationship with food. And so when I was young, right, as an undergrad student, uh, you know, I was really interested in the language of the diet culture that was all around me. So I was interested in like the diet part to chain restaurant menus, right? How did the Cheesecake Factory and Olive Garden and Red Lobster, right? Rest <laughs> restaurants I thought were really great when I was 21 years old, right? Like how did they conceive of like the skinny part of their menu, the light part of their menu, right? The ways um, that these very commercial mainstream everyday food spaces, right? We're conceiving of lightness and diet culture. Um, I was looking at, you know, women's magazines, right? A, a medium that has much less influence today, but was still, right, really influential in sort of my upbringing and right around that turn of, you know, into the new millennium. Um, and then thinking about diet books themselves, right, as secular texts that have these religious themes to them, right, of how we talk about going on a diet and sharing it with others, um, feeling sort of transformed, right, by the process of losing weight, for example. And so starting from, you know, that work as an undergrad, trying to understand this world of food around me. Um, it was a way to untease, you know, to be able to unravel um, those sort of complicated uh, relationships with food that I knew wasn't just unique to myself or to my family, but was an interesting cultural challenge in the United States in particular. Um, but because of the time that I was studying, right, right around that 2000 to 2005 sort of time period, that was when like Atkins and South Beach were really popular. And so these were low carb diets. They felt different, you know, compared to the low fat diets, you know, that, uh, you know, were very much sort of salads and fruits and vegetables and that sort of thing. Like you could eat a lot of different things on low carb. And so we saw men and women, right, go on low carb diets in really similar numbers. So there was a very different gendered conversation around the mainstream diets that people were going on. So that's how I jumped on. Um, to trying to understand men and masculinities and dieting as a starting point. And then once I started working on my dissertation, right, that's where diners, dudes, and diets come from, that it's our entire media scape. It's not just the world of dieting. It's fascinating. As are these poll findings. So 43% food on social media. Yeah, so you're kind of with my students, right? But that's where the majority of us are thinking. But interesting too, 21% of us going to food TV, um, right? If we think about the influence of Food Network, right? Coming in the early 1990s that all of a sudden put, um, you know, cooking content on television, um, on cable, right? All throughout the week. Um, and then cookbooks, right? Texts that I collect and analyze and cook from um, that we have a really even split between these more traditional food media forms, right? The cookbook um, and the food television show. And so 
many different genres within those, right? Like you can see all of my Guy Fieri cookbooks, right? But that was thinking about, you know, the food TV moment that made him. There's a whole chapter in my book about Guy Fieri in particular. It was so much fun to write. I always joke I could have written a whole book just about him um, for how much, um, you know, polarizing potential there was at the beginning of how people reacted to him and the food media empire that he created. Um, but thinking about not just, you know, the food cooking show when we think about Julia Child, who certainly brings us um, a new and different manifestation of celebrity, of authenticity, right? Her willingness to make mistakes, to truly, uh, you know, speak to the viewer and, you know, want to help all of us, right? To rise to this challenge, um, to be able to cook you know, really uh, well executed French cuisine at home. Um, but then, you know, this shift towards, um, you know, sort of daytime cooking television for a while that was educational and about learning how to cook. But then our evening programming, right, was often competitive based, um, that it had this very different feeling in the content that was being created. And that's this moment that Guy Fieri goes on Next Food Network Star, this, you know, competition show of like who would win their own show on Food Network. And so he's been one of the only ones to win that program and then go on to, you know, a huge successful career. But that model, right, of the, the competition show um, has certainly, right, had its hooks in food media and spread quite widely. Um, that there aren't a whole lot of things we can turn on now, right? Where we can just learn a really interesting, delicious recipe that we could make for dinner. Um, that there's been this interesting shift, you know, far more towards entertainment and particularly competition. How does gender do? You, how does gender play into the the rise of the food competition show? And then I do mm -hmm. want to get back to the poll in a minute, but I don't want to lose that question. No, definitely. So before Guy Fieri, we have Emeril, right? Any of you, you know, who grew up watching, you know, Emeril Lagasse, um, or not just grow up, right? We have all sorts of wonderful ages here with us. Um, so he was the first, right, sort of credited of bringing in um, a more masculine audience, right? They joked about how, you know, guys in the firehouse, right, would be watching him, you know, while they were making dinner to feed one another, that men tuned into Food Network, um, given the content that Emeril Lagasse was, was uh, creating, um, that was more energetic, that was too a live audience, right? He would, uh, you know, he would put liquor in things and yell, bam, right? There was fire, right? There were these different kinds of performance elements that he brought into it. And so interestingly enough, in that final episode of Next Food Network Star, when Guy Fieri wins, it's Emeril Lagasse, right, who announces, um, right, that he's the one who's won. And it's an interesting sort of passing of the torch, right, of a dude chef um, who comes in with diners, drive-ins and dives and other subsequent shows really um, increases, right, the male audience for prime time. Food Network uh, programming. And so there is this shift towards the competition, but also particular stars like Guy Fieri to bring in more gender balance to that primetime audience on food TV, at least on Food Network. Do we see a parallel in other kinds of media in this kind of uh, gender swapping where it was a female uh, oriented medium um, uh, in terms of its the, the topic was? Um, Julia Child, as you mentioned, it was cookbooks, it was women uh, centered. And, and as you so smoothly show that now we're in this era of nighttime food competition shows, it's highly uh, energized, aggressive, mm -hmm. it's a really different feel. And so do you see any other parallels in other subject areas where, where we've seen this in the media? Absolutely. So this is one of the key threads in my book, Diners, Dudes and Diets, of looking at how did various right food marketers and media makers go about uh, trying to sell to men what were perceived to be these feminized sort of aspects of food. Um, and so for thinking about food TV, right, Guy Fieri is the story that I tell about cooking on television, as well as the cookbooks that he writes. Um, and then there's a whole corpus, right, from sort of 2000 to 2020. Um, of cookbooks written, you know, intentionally for men, right? Trying to get uh, men to buy cookbooks and to cook at home, um, but all with this perception, right? That this feminine quality has to be overcome, right? Sort of has to be thwarted, has to be negotiated for men to feel comfortable, right? Buying a cookbook, watching food television. Um, the food examples I give, right? How do brands go about getting men to buy diet soda? 
or to buy yogurts, right? So looking um, at particular brands, right? That launch for men, the packaging they choose, the brand, you know, sort of taglines they go with, the color choices they make, right? There's so many different ways to analyze that. Um, and then in my last chapter, I sort of returned to my original interests with diet culture. How did commercial diet programs go after men? Focusing on Weight Watchers, uh, but also looking at some of our other big ones like Nutrisystem and Jenny Craig. And so what I argue is that in each of those examples, what these brands and media makers do is that they have to engage men in a conversation about masculinity, right? If there's this perception that this is feminine and that's bad, that you have to overcome that. Um, and so there's a marketing concept called gender contamination that tries to give a name to this um, concern that men who view something as feminine, right, are going to resist it being trying to be masculinized, right? They're not going to want to consume something girly, right, to state it really colloquially. And so in each of these examples, I look at what does that process look like, right? How do these brands and media, media makers try to reach men, right? How do they try to compensate um, for this perception of femininity? And so some examples um, are creative, some are straight up misogynist, but the through line of what the book contributes is thinking about a specific kind of masculinity that I ended up calling the dude, that this is a hybrid masculinity that in some ways ways adheres to what we would expect, right, men in sort of American society and culture to act and eat like and think like and conduct themselves and think about their bodies and, you know, produce them and work them out in particular ways. But the dude was a slacker hero, right? He could resist some of those demands and get away with it. And so he could also be a figure who um, was involved with food and interested in food, but in a way that was so nonchalant, right? So casual, so checked out that there was no way that it impinged, right? On sort of masculine authority or sort of the production of like masculine character. And so the dude is what I look at sort of through all of those. And so often, right, like to actually triumph over gender contamination in the marketplace is pretty tricky to be able to do. Um, and so after I finished this book, um, I actually wrote a whole other article about White Claw, this hard seltzer. Um, and so hard seltzers as a category, right? So in alcohol, you know, the industry, you know, folks uh, liken the rise of hard seltzer to, you know, the biggest shape, shape up right in the alcoholic you know drink industry since light beer like it's really changed you know what demographic different demographics of folks are drinking how they feel about it what are they leaving behind because they're picking up hard seltzer and so in the beginning hard seltzer is very clearly for women you can look at sort of feminine designs in the can the shape of the can um the emphasis they put on sort of like light nutrition right like they're really doing sort of feminized diet culture kind of message um there are you know campaigns you know the advertising campaigns lean very feminine um the first super bowl commercial ever for a hard seltzer is for bon and viv and it's two mermaids right underwater you know in sort of like a real shark tank right like they're actually sharks right who they're pitching their product to um which is like creative and lovely, but it's also like very clearly for women. And so White Claw becomes this, you know, they have a much more gender balanced message, look and feel and how they launch themselves. And then in the absence of a particular marketing message, they just become a cultural hit among young people and particularly a young among young college aged guys. And so that's part of what helps all hard seltzer to sort of be understood in a different way, right? It's no longer a drink for women or, for, you know, for young college age girls who, you know, don't drink harder things or other things. And then it becomes, right, this drink that like men in particular and young men drink um, and enjoy and like can do so ironically or seriously. And so it's really interesting to think about how everything from social and cultural norms around flavor, ingredients, nutritional information, packaging design, colors, different visual motifs, right? All of these things come together um, around food to construct an idea of like a gendered identity for the food product. Um, when that is what marketers want to do, right? When they want to target to a particular audience, they bring all of that to bear and constructing it that way. When of course, the truth is, that, you know, no food is essentially gendered, right? Like food is just food, but we make it that way, right? Through our social and cultural processes. And so all the examples I'm looking at in the book have gone through that. And then they were trying to negotiate it into a different space. 
That, that's a great example, the, 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 the white claw. The, there are folks in our, our chat, for, I'm thinking of Stephen at um, Ells Brewery. I, I would love to hear um, from you and other food marketers in our um, participants today uh, in the Q&A. Please feel free to, to lob a question in. Um, but I'm curious if for the food marketers among you, if there, if you've seen that you have to combat, I'm thinking particularly of, of Stephen who mentioned he's the uh, a, a marketer for Bell's Brewery, yeah. and is um, is beer a uh, a uniquely male um, beverage? I mean, is that one of the things that they have to address? Um, Kelly has a great, uh, who's my awesome colleague in the School of Communication at Western Michigan University, a, a fantastic film instructor and filmmaker. Kelly is asking, where does Alton Brown fit into all of this, um, Dr. Contoy? His show, Good Eats, was a lot like Bill Nye the Science Guy. Um, I'm not quite sure what that means. Uh, I do, I'm, don't worry. Okay, <laughs> all right, good. You can unpack it for all of us. And then you move to hosting Iron Chef. So is from instructional to this sort of combative, aggressive com um, co competition-based show? Yes, no, you're pointing to a good transition here, Kelly, um, from a space that is um, a little bit more educational. And for that reason, perhaps genders uh, more feminine and then to this more competitive space of Iron Chef. Um, but I think what uh, the way that I've always thought about Alton Brown is that throughout all of it, he was he was interested in the science, right, that there was this masculinization um, to viewing it through that scientific lens. And so I've similarly thought about, for example, um, how different supplements right are marketed um, if you look at the, the side right of whether it's creatine or a different protein powder right all these different supplements how the language and even the imagery right of science is deployed to lend a sort of masculine authority um, to certain culinary products and processes and so i think alton brown right always had that um sort of like scientific nerdy kind of approach right that was interested in details that was interested in scientific processes, um, that he was always able to sort of navigate that space that's still gendered masculine, even as it was educational. Um, and then even as he goes on to Iron Chef, right, he he plays a different role than someone like Bobby Flay, for example, um, or for any of, you know, our Japanese masters who are part of Iron Chef, um, that they all get to operate, you know, in these different spaces. Um, and so I definitely have colleagues who've done really interesting analyses in the cookbook world and in the food television vision world, sort of codifying a number um, of like masculine types that we see. Um, and so for me to theorize in my own work, right, this idea of the dude as another gender type to sort of add to that list um, is another way to think about this. Um, there have been other scholars to go back to beer um, who've thought about the gender types that we typically see in beer advertising. And so there was, you know, the loser who was kind of similar to the dude, right, um, who we see sort of just like hanging out with his friends. Um, it's interesting too, seeing how women are depicted and sort of traditional beer advertising, um, they tend to either be solely objectified, right, and they're only shown in sort of sexually objectifying ways where they don't have a lot of subjectivity or power, um, or they're sort of the naggy wife, right, that there are these really very limited roles in the past of how women, um, you know, were portrayed in beer advertising. And so there's an interesting tension as brands um, for, for various liquors, for example, right, go after women, um, that do we think it is uh, progress for these brands to now represent women or to swap in a woman in the Johnny Walker logo every once in a while, right? She has her big boots and her hat, um, you know, or does that make us, you know, concerned as we think about, you know, shifts in women's actual drinking patterns, right? Like there's interesting ways of how we think about, um, is this empowerment or is this a kind of ex equal exploitation that we see taking place in representation? There are interesting dynamics there. Um, but before we leave Guy Fieri all alone, I do want to point, Anu has a really great um, sort of contribution in the chat of thinking of how Guy Fieri and class politics and class hierarchy, so that was definitely a big part of my chapter as well, um, that he re resonates in a really powerful way as sort of a populist food figure. Um, I was, um, I cite this amazing piece the New York Times did where early 
on in his career, like he's famous, but he's not who he is today. He did this rock and roll cooking tour where he would go to stadiums, right, to arenas and do a cooking show, um, you know, and play sort of like rock music and there'd be like pyrotechnics. And it was just like all the ridiculousness that you would expect from Guy Fieri. And so when the reporter goes and interviews people in the audience, right? Like they love Guy Fieri and they don't identify as sort of your typical foodie. They would shun, right? The perceived sort of pretension of a foodie, um, but they love food and they love Guy Fieri. And so they say things like, you know, he's never talking down to you, right? Like he just loves food and he's telling you good places to go get tasty eats. Um, and so they follow him the way other people might follow, right? The Michelin Guide, right? And, you know, go to restaurants that have earned those stars. Um, for them, right, Guy Fieri is this sort of populist figure who says it like it is, and they view him as authentic and wonderful and lovable, and so they value the food that he values as well. And Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives was a pretty special show that way. I think at this point, he's been to all 50 states. He's shot, you know, puts a spotlight on, you know, various different cuisines, different heritages, um, you know, different ethnic and immigrant groups um, that he really, right, shows us an interest interesting example, right? I definitely, right, there was so much I wanted to write about Guy Fieri, I had to spin some of it off into an article. Um, and so that show, Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, does a version of sort of uh, laying out an idea of what American food could look like and taste like. And so I critique elements of it, but on one level, it is a really valid attempt um, that he does, right, and the kinds of restaurants he's giving attention to, um, which is really fascinating. It definitely has these class-based elements. I really appreciate it. Anu has a, a, a an additional comment, which is super weird that someone <laughs> who is popular is a populist food figure can't stand of all things eggs. I know it is one of his weird quirks. I kind of can't believe, right, to be populist, but also to like be a chef, right? Like to be someone who works in food and be weirded out by, you know, a runny egg, that that is such a, um, you know, sort of unbelievable, right? Sort of food preference for a food media star to have. Um, but I think that was something else, you know, that I write about in the book that he, you know, talks about how, the, you know, there are still people in America who, you know, don't want to eat, you know, raw fish sushi, right? Like for them, that still feels like a taboo. That's still feels, you know, like something, you know, outside of the boundaries of the food culture that they're a part of and that they want to partake in. And so I put that, you know, side by side, right? Like him saying, you know, oh, I am fully aware, right? That there's a portion of the American populace who doesn't want to eat this. And so I'm going to make them a barbecue chicken one, right? And he's not going to put, you know, the seaweed, he's going to use a rice paper, you know, which are much more, you know, light flavor. It's not really going to push your palate to explore, right? You can stay, you know, sort of with what you like. And so that is coming out from him in his cookbooks and in his you know television shows at the same time that a publication like food and wine right is declaring that like all of america right are now these you know incredibly informed sushi eaters right like down to you know the type of fish in the region and you know all in all of this detail, right, that we would associate with sort of the obsessed foodie um, who has, you know, this cultural knowledge, this extra money, um, and this, you know, veracity for the knowledge behind, you know, all of the consumption that he does. He gives voice and support and um, uh, a sort of, um, you know, that he believes in, right, the people who are sort of anti-foodies but love food, right? Like, I found him so fascinating for how he spoke to them that part of our country and people who love food that way. I hope, I think we'll, we'll be coming back to him throughout our, our time together this evening. Is food always uh, about class? Mm. It's always about class. Well, I mean, trained, right, as a feminist, <laughs> right, in intersectionality theory, right, that I think, you know, we can't ever get outside of any of our identity categories, right, when we think about food, uh, that food is always class, it is always gender, it's always sexuality, it is always region and nation, right, of the areas of the world we're about, it, it always intersects with our bodily abilities and our abilities to eat and to engage with food and to move through the world, um, that it is all these pieces right of our identity at once and that you can't tease them apart um you know both these expressions of privilege and of oppression um that food indexes all of those as well um whether it's our own identities our own access to food our own histories with food um but yeah it's always class and it's always all these other things about us too thank you and kelly i'm going to get to your question but i wanted to follow up for a minute on uh gendered food and, and speaking of Guy Fieri and 
we've been talking about food as binary, as male, female, masculine, mm -hmm. feminine. Mm -hmm. What have you noticed, Dr. Contoy, about food media in relation to LGBTQ a plus culture? No, definitely. So I think that was one of the frustrating findings of my book, that our food media life, right, part of its marketing, part of its all of these various food media forms that we've talked about, has had an out a huge role, right, in reinforcing a really strict gender binary, right, the idea that this is feminine, this is masculine, these are the two options, and really codified understandings of what those two categories were. And so that was part of at first, like the hope that I saw in White Claw, right? Like I write about it really briefly in the conclusion to the book because a lot of people were writing about that particular brand for taking what they were calling a post-gender, right? Or a gender neutral approach um, to their marketing. That this was a food that was for everyone, right? It was for men, it was for women, it was for non-binary folks, it was for agender folks, right? No matter how you identified, this was a beverage that was a part of your cool hang, right? And you should be a part of it. And so, so I point to that in the conclusion of the book as like a potential right way for us to think beyond that gender binary. Yeah. But I couldn't stop thinking about it because I think all of that press gave uh, White Claw far too much credit uh, that when I went back and looked at the full history of hard seltzer and all the different brands that were available at the beginning and then how it explodes, that I think um, White Claw as a brand, right, was able to learn from past attempts of gender contamination, right, trying to get hard lemonades, for example, to be consumed by more young men and failing. And so I think they learned their lesson. And so they wanted to make sure that this product wasn't perceived as feminine and that it was accessible um, and deemed appropriate and delicious, right, for young men in particular. And so I really, you know, started pushing back against not just the idea of gender contamination, but to acknowledge that this whole idea of consumers resisting brand gender bending re-entrenches the idea of a gender binary and that that's what it is. Um, and that this idea of gender contamination most strongly influences, right, straight men, right, and their resistance and their hesitancy um, to engage uh, with what's perceived to be sort of feminine food, drink, bodily practices, and so on. And so there are amazing things happening, right, as we think about queer food and queer chefs and, you know, amazing cookbooks, um, you know, written from a different, right, queer perspective to think about flavor, to think about dishes, right, to again, and whatever perspective we bring, right, we see things with new eyes as we bring more people with more identities and more experiences to the table. Um, so I think of, you know, someone like Jonathan Birdsall, um, who wrote, you know, this amazing biography um, of James Beard and is now, you know, writing another book, you know, all about queer food. Um, but I think, right, so I think there is, you know, incredible terrain, right, for queer chefs to make their name and to have this unique perspective. I think marketing has a long way to go to actually um, be able to represent, right, all of these far more gender diverse experiences and to get outside of this really limited, you know, structure for thinking about target marketing, the idea that we think we know what woman and man is anyway, right, like they're not even doing that right. And then, right, to imagine being beyond that, to speak authentically beyond that, um, are things that I think are still being worked out to do well. Um, but I think too, I think I, I go back to a piece that's a little bit older that I always assign for my food media students um, that's thinking, right, about the work of queer folks in the kitchen. And it's an intersectional piece where, you know, these women who identify as lesbians, right, some of color, some white, um, talk about their experiences in the kitchen. And they were like, being gay wasn't what held me back in the kitchen, right? It was like men perceiving me as a woman, right? It was still misogyny, it was still patriarchy um, in their words, right? That were holding them back in the kitchen. And so I think there's interesting tensions as we think about um, how these oppressions are felt, how they shape the restaurant kitchen, how they shape the world of you know, cookbook publishing, how they shape who you get to be, what persona you get to have on food television or as an influencer, right? Whether you have your, your own YouTube channel or you're creating your own content on TikTok or Instagram, um, that there are interesting ways people are pushing outside of these boxes. But I think the industries themselves, right, have a lot of road to cover to really do this better and authentically.
before I get to Kelly's question, I'm going to just going to put a, a media literacy pin in what you just said, and that is Please. that um, different people experience the same message differently. Mm -hmm. And so, as White Claw, you know, as any marketer knows, um, depending on who your target audience is and who you're looking to pursue and ultimately um, own in terms of their attention and their consumer dollars, um, the idea that different people are going to to take in and interpret um, your advertising and marketing differently. The White Claw example is a really good uh, instance of that, I think. And um, it's interesting to me also, as, you're, if, as you've been speaking, how much uh, food media excludes or champions different points of view. Mm -hmm. And a media literacy principle is that all media messages have embedded points of view. Mm -hmm. They have a value. And so, as Anu was mentioning earlier um, about um, uh, culture and social status in relation to um, Guy Fieri, and 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 in your in your book, you talk about um, dude food and and it being more lowbrow and accessible to a wide range of people. Um, it's interesting to me to think about um, which points of view are championed in any one of these examples that you've lifted up. So. No, exactly. And I think the issue has been for far too long across every media form we can name, right? It's been a dominant perspective that's been white and male and straight and able-bodied. Um, and that's, right, limited, right? The stories that have been told, the perspectives, right, that have been made available. And even when we tell stories, right, from an identity outside of that, sometimes it's with the presumption of a white audience, right? This expectation to translate um, a marginalized experience for white consumption. And so when we think about these moments where people speak back, right? Like I think social media is such an interesting space there. Um, for the comments or the retweets or the duets, right? Like all these ways that we speak back and are able to speak back to sort of these dominant, um, more hegemonic, right? To use this sort of academic language, um, the representation that we've seen, right? Across food television, who gets a cookbook deal, right? Who's a popular influencer, right? Across all these different food media forms. They were in a moment, right? Where there is more change, there is more diversity, right? That we're getting to a better place, um, but we're not there yet, right? That there is still so much work left to be done. That's a great lead into Kelly's question. How does the United States compare to male chefs on TV from other countries, such as British Naked mm -hmm. Chef, Jamie Oliver, yeah. and how have careers changed over time? Yes, so lots of people have studied Jamie Oliver because he's such an interesting masculine figure um, and that he has sort of like a, a boyish sort of quality to him, right? He's not quite a dude and that he's not a slacker, um, but he does have this approachability um, that is coupled with um, his expertise, right, of what he's actually able to cook and what he's actually able to teach. Um, and then I think he's also interesting because of the way that he navigates fatherhood as a part of his brand, um, the way he talks about home cooking and himself cooking in the home, um, not for performance and not just for sort of his media, but to feed his family. Um, and so Guy Fieri, right, off also um, sort of softened, right, what he often liked to put forth as his sort of rocker persona, right, that he was this guy guy pushing boundaries and doing whatever he wanted to do, but he was also, right, from his audition tape for Next Food Network star, a man really committed to being a father. Um, and so as we look at how, you know, his media empire has grown, right, his sons, right, are often, um, and very often, you know, a part of um, his cookbooks and his shows and his social media platforms, right, the content that he's putting out. And so Jamie Oliver navigates that interestingly as well, um, of how he includes his family and feeding the family. Um, and then I'll also say that one of my colleagues who's in Australia um, wrote a really interesting analysis of Jamie Oliver's uh, show that he produced during the confines of COVID. So there were a set of episodes that were filmed like in a professional studio, you know, sort of before, you know, really strict lockdowns took place in the UK. And then there are these episodes that he filmed at home on an iPhone 
And so she talks about um, this amazing like intimacy that was made possible, right? Like the pandemic hurt us in so many ways, right? We will carry scars for the rest of our lives from what we went through. But there were also these interesting breakthrough moments, right? Of what was made possible via technologies, via our desire to connect when we couldn't physically be together. And so she analyzes in such a smart way um, how the uh, amateurness, right? The amateur quality of the production compared to sort of the slick commercial look and feel that we're accustomed to of food television actually created a food politics that was revolutionary and different and intimate and special. Um, so I think Jamie Oliver is another, right? Fascinating text that many, many people have analyzed because of that. Um, and so I think he's another interesting figure for his masculinity, but also this like longer career he's had. And that's not even to talk about, you know, the the, the seasons of the show, right, where he's changing, the, trying to change the way America eats, right, that I think he slips, you know, in interesting ways into trying to do nutrition education in ways that sometimes work and sometimes don't. Um, but to the other piece of the question, right, of thinking about these um, norms of gender, and particularly of masculinity when it comes to chefs and to television chefs, um, uh, that in Western cultures around the world, right, throughout Europe, the United Kingdom, um, Australia, that you would see very similar, right, things that would be very familiar to us as Americans when it comes to the representation um, and the actual um, sort of strictures, right, of day-to-day -day restaurant life. Um, I have another colleague um, who, you know, wrote an incredible book um, about uh, women chefs in France, right, and so we think here, right, about the travesty of, you know, about 80%, right, of head chefs are men. We have a really big disparity here, uh, but it's even more entrenched, right, when we look to France and its long history um, of, you know, the traditions that the French system in particular created that then traveled the world, right, and have shaped the way um, that we train uh, folks to be chefs, how we run restaurant kitchens in that very traditional hierarchical way. Um, so those would definitely be some examples where we would find um, similar, right, sort of hierarchies when we come to thinking about masculinity and chefs, whether the representation of them in media or the actual world um, of chefs, of culinaries. Well, see, that's the interesting thing. So we have to go there, right? Culinary school graduates men and women at just about the same rate, right? It's really close to 50-50. It's actually quite close with film school, right? To give us another media example, right? Men and women also graduate very similar rates from film school. But when we look at, right, who gets to direct, who wins best picture, right? Who wins James Beard Awards? Who gets to own their restaurant, be a head chef, get great reviews, right? Be revered, right? As a genius, um, you know, by food media and food critics, right? It all still skews, right? Very dramatically male in this. Kelly noted that she loved Jamie for the intimacy that you mentioned. Um, yeah. how precious it was during lockdown. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I am curious, uh, before we run to the question about um, authenticity infusion, aren't we missing, a, an, an especially in uh, all of our examples so far, also have been very Western. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, Dr. Kenote mentioned in uh, her introduction to why she was here that she loves cooking and uses um, her uh, culture and background to influence um, and celebrate her culture. And so I'm curious how much we miss or are we, is it the, um, we're not noticing it and it's out there or is it not being lifted up in terms of um, non-Western ways of uh, relating to food, and then seeing that depicted in the media that we can find. No, in absolutely. Yes, I think we're in an interesting and important moment, right, particularly with different streaming platforms, that there are so many different opportunities, right, for different food shows to get bought and to have different perspectives. Um, so whether we're thinking of something, you know, like Padma Lakshmi's show on Hulu, right, which was particularly about shining a light um, on different immigrant experiences and immigrant cuisines within the United States to tell those histories, those flavors, those skills, um, you know, those, you know, incredible traditions that are being brought and then, uh, 
you know, reimagined and turned into something new, um, sort of on American soil where we have cultures coming together. Um, but also, right, thinking about the long established and irrefutable, right, contribution of African and African American cooks to American food, not just in the American South and what we think of as Southern cuisine, but to American food. Um, so I think there are so many efforts to reclaim that history, to tell that history properly. Um, so whether we think of, um, you know, Dr. Jessica B. Harris's work, you know, High on the Hog, and then the Netflix show of the same name um, that, you know, goes um, to Africa and then also throughout the United States, right, to really look at um, the flow of ingredients, of botanical knowledge, of cooking knowledge, um, you know, from, um, you know, African and African-American individuals enslaved and free, right, of how that has shaped our nation's food culture. Um, and so we think for too long, right, those were stories that were minimized or were not acknowledged or were viewed as a history that people didn't want to pay attention to. Um, but now we have something as beautiful, right, as this Netflix season um, that tells these histories in a beautifully produced, well thought out, right, intellectually rigorous, you know, culinarily innovative and imaginative, um, that it shows all of these possibilities. And so I think these shifts, right, of beyond just, you know, sort of traditional television, just cookbooks, um, that we do have so much more food media now. And so the hope is that there's more opportunity to tell lots of different stories. Um, but I still have, you know, colleagues who are food writers or trying to get their, you know, cookbook out there. And it's like, oh, well, you know, will someone, you know, will people really buy, right, a Filipino cookbook? Or we have one, why would we ever publish another one, right? Or we just ran a story on Indian cuisine, right? Like, we can't do another one, right? Like, how many can we do you know about hot dogs and meatloaf right and all these I was like gonna say we have 27 meat. barbecuing exactly <laughs> and i mean the history of barbecue too right to acknowledge it's you know really complex um you know racial and ethnic roots as well right that we can tell these more complicated stories um but yeah it's always that balance and so i think it's not just diversifying you know who's writing and who's pitching who's doing the work but also thinking about who's in those positions of power um to edit um to you know yeah. to ask for stories right that we need um um, that diversification right at every level um, across media right and not just in food right but that's how we really get to um, a media scape that is interesting and creative and reflective of all of us um, yes. I think there was an advertising podcast I love where they're citing this panel right of like you know white men creatives right who have sort of controlled advertising since the beginning of its modern days the 1920s and they're musing you know oh you know are we out of creativity right like what is there left to do and so it's all these black creatives who are young and they're just like let's have a shot right there's tons left to be done right like you might think you've done everything but like tons of other people right haven't had their opportunity so there's so much untapped right of the stories we can tell the flavors we can think about right like all this stuff um, that food media can make possible when we diversify who has a seat at the table and who is in a position of power and authority and decision making where they are equally paid for their contributions I, one of the reasons I love the Food Waste Symposium is what you just tapped into, which is food is a vehicle for all these. It's an interdisciplinary conversation yes, about history and class and 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 race and ethnicity and cultures and, you know, Western and then the whole rich, you know, uh, non-Western part of the world that's way too often ignored in our Western media. Um, I'm going to shout out another media literacy principle as we're trying to pull that that strand through this conversation and that yes, is they can all test in the exhibit right like the <laughs> conversation isn't over tonight go to the that's museum it. i'm so heartbroken i can't go see it in person i need the digital well, version <laughs> that's we're, we're working on it uh, <laughs> that media messages are organized specifically to gain profit and or power and so your example just then dr contoy about you know, if you're a, how many Filipino cookbooks do we need? Well, we certainly need more than one as in, in your example. And so thinking about who are the gatekeepers there and who decides um, uh, in terms of profit and power, what's enough and who's going to get the power. And um, I want to circle uh, to our second question and then we'll keep up our conversation. If we could please post um, in the poll uh, question number two, which is which of the following food TV chefs is your favorite? I don't want to lose the Jamie Oliver strand um, without asking this question and, and hearing from you all. And I'd like to say, if you don't see your person listed in the um, poll choices, just Tell us in the put chat. a little note in the chat. 
Yeah, definitely. And I think as that comes up, we're interested to see what people say. Kelly's also giving us good recommendations, right, for other women chefs, right, and the difficult stories they've had. Um, a Chef's Life on PBS and Somewhere South um, with, chef, with Chef Vivian Howard. So I will have to look those up. Thank you for those, Kelly. Um, and also, the, yes, of course, Bridget and, and Julia, right, as female cost in America's Test Kitchen, um, which is sort of this rigorous testing, right, and like really about making sure your recipes turn out. Um, that No, those are really great. Thank you for that, Kelly. Um, and so for question number two, right, you can tell us which one of these, um, you know, quite mainstream, right, sort of celebrity chefs would be your favorite when you think about the food television that you watch. Um, we've got a little bit of a range. I'm interested to see uh, what people think. I think part of how we came up with this question was just looking at, you know, sort of like the top Google search results, right? So we've been talking about, you know, media rep representation across so many different places, but the fact that Google search, right, and search engine optimization, right, like all of these things also guide, right, our responses um, in ways that sometimes continue to represent just that dominant perspective, right, that can be white and male and straight and all the things that we've been talking about. Um, so Jackie doesn't like our options, right, why does it say Tabernacle Brown, um, Alton Brown, Tabitha Brown, um, right, a whole <laughs> lots of chefs um, with the last name Brown are good ones that we should be, um, that we should be watching and reading and learning from these are all great <laughs> no worries oh thanks for putting it back tabernacle i was like i've never heard of tabernacle Brown. i was like i missed that one so thank you jackie, thank you, jackie. <laughs> that's so great yep um i said it's on thank you i knew who's that can you quick yeah, yeah is that actually I someone who I like know the name, but I'm not super familiar with. So okay, all really right. Tell us more, like them. what they like about her content. Thank you. Um, ah, okay. Ah, thank you, thank you. Well, this is actually right to say the grammar of Italian cooking is something interesting um, that often when we think about how food media tries to uh, market um, a chef in a mainstream way, they'll often say, right, this is the Julia Child of Korean cooking. This is the Julia Child, right, of Italian cooking. So not to say at all that that's what Anu is pointing to, but that's another example, right, of how a more mainstream perspective um, tends to sort of, uh, you know, reach out. Uh, so interesting. So of these options, Options. Our leader is Gordon Ramsay, yelly man himself, um, <laughs> who, right? Like definitely brings a different persona on like the child's version of his show. And so it's interesting to see him like dial it back. Um, but a version, right, of sort of the ugly, you know, angry side, right, of some of these cooking shows where you're quite berated in the kitchen and sort of treated as, you know, um, you know, a lowly sort of kitchen person. Um, although I think there's other ones. I always liked the one where he went to the restaurants. Uh, yes, I will totally co-sign with Samin Nasrat that that's um, definitely someone we should all know and love and be watching. Um, and then Anthony Bourdain, like I find it really interesting that he still comes up, right, as the second highest one here. Um, that he's such an interesting figure for, you know, he writes one of these He's on this cusp, right, where the celebrity chef is becoming an American phenomenon. Before the late 90s, 2000s, right, a chef was just a blue collar job, right? Like you wouldn't want to go meet that person or, you know, uh, get to talk to them or follow them. You know, I mean, there was no Instagram, right? But like, it was a very different kind of role. And so Bourdain is in this moment, right? Of sort of codifying what that celebrity chef is like. And it's very much in this like, you know, rocker, um, you know, doing drugs and drinking and you know, the intensity, um, you know, this idea of a bunch of misfits, right? Like brought together and, you know, they're all tattooed and angry um, and they couldn't survive anywhere else, but they can be these amazing geniuses in the kitchen um, that his memoir, right, like Kitchen Confidential, springboards a different moment in food writing, right, of people wanting to read stories about chefs, about restaurants, about food, but he also codifies, right, like a, a bad uh, version of the chef, right, who's um, misogynistic and is bad to people around him um, and is a quite sort of negative influence. So I find Anthony Bourdain so 
amazing because he really transforms, right? As a man, as um, as a chef, as a gastro diplomat, right? On his shows, as he goes out and represents the United States. Um, I have another friend, Ali Alcon. She wrote an essay, right? That he was, right? Our nation's gastro diplomat in a mediated, right? On his TV show as he went out, um, you know, the meal he has with Obama, right? Like all these incredible episodes um, that I think the moment, you know, where we lost him, you know, from his life and from our food media scape um, was at a moment where he was really becoming someone very special, right? Of leading us somewhere else of what food media could be and how men who'd been a perhaps quite negative part of food media, right? Could become something else, could make something else possible. Um, I continue to think that he's really important and really interesting. Yes. Um, only one, right? So no one's no one's a Guy Fieri fan. We're not going there. Just one Reed Drummond, right? Like that's kind of wild for me coming to Oklahoma. Like the pioneer woman is, you know, sort of local celebrity. You know, you can go to, you know, her restaurant and all of that, like not too far from here. So that's an interesting example. Mm. Uh, Ina Garten, right, has been on Food Network for such a long time um, and doesn't have to represent, you know, sort of a, a showy uh, sort of femininity, right? Like she's a much more... Uh, sort of just like maternal kind of figure. Um, and then to sort of be you know, sort of reclaimed and championed, you know, during the pandemic, right, with like her gigantic cocktails, right? Like I think I um, she navigated social media in that moment in a really fascinating way. And she's um, one of the few chefs that will say, go ahead and get the store bought, whatever. Like, yes, this is a realist. Yeah, yeah. yeah she's a realist. So talented, right? And has her beautiful farmhouse, right? Like there's there's elements of her that are kind of similar to Martha Stewart, but then, right, she has these edges, um, you know, where she's much more accommodating, much more of a realist, <laughs> much funnier, uh, right? That she's really interesting that way. Uh, interesting to have Paula Dean, right? Like she had this sort of fall from grace, but was very popular on Food Network, a similar, uh, she was also, right, one of these celebrity judges on the season that Guy Fieri was on. So that's exactly the food media moment right that he originates from when she still would have been on uh leah chase from a new right really important right uh black female chef restaurateur cookbook author absolutely uh, jose andres we should have put him in uh, he's definitely in the book right i was really fascinated by how people found um guy fieri's uh charitable work uh, particularly during the pandemic right um uh and he also, um, you know, fed emergency crews and displaced folks, you know, during the wildfires in California, um, wildfires years ago, right now it's become just commonplace with climate crisis, which is very sad. Um, but I'm interested in these comparisons, right, between Guy Fieri and Jose Andres, right, who not only, right, through World Kitchen, right, goes to, you know, disaster areas to feed people, right, to have food be a part, right, of how we respond to any global crisis. Um, um, but as a man with politics, right? Like he was, uh, you know, held no punches in his relationship with President Trump, for example, right? Not wanting his restaurant to be in Trump Tower. Um, he was quite pointed in his critiques of the, the Trump presidency and administration's response to Hurricane Maria. Um, and so I think there's a disconnect, right? That people want Guy Fieri, right? To be the sort of heir apparent um, to the charitable work that Jose Andres uh, you know, has put forth and really believes in and embodies as well as, right, being an incredible chef who makes really, you know, incredible, beautiful, delicious food. Um, but I don't see Guy Fieri, like, truly stepping up, right, to, like, have a political perspective, to take a chance, to take a risk, to believe in something other than just flavor town, right? Like, I think there's, there's a big difference between the two of them. So I totally agree that that's another really important one. Oh, I somehow haven't watched Anisha Bora, Kelly. I'll have to look her up. Um, oh, and same with Paolo Velez. I'm not as familiar. Need to look that one up. Some really good recommendations in the chat. You should all make sure you can grab them. Really fun. Um, thank you for responding to um, our favorite food TV chefs. That's a really fun one. Um, I'm, I, I love uh, getting to interview you because um, I'm not a huge foodie. Uh, I'm, uh, I just eat food to keep going. And so I, I think it's really interesting from a every person point of view. Um, one of the things that I would love to explore with you for a minute um, is uh, 
a news question because it, it feels like a foodie question. And that is uh, the talk about the duel between authenticity and fusion in food and food, foodie culture. And you're mm -hmm. going to have to explain, unpack that a little bit for um, neophytes like me. Sure. So one thread of this that I want to bring in first um, is that whenever, right, a ingredient, a recipe, a whole cultural perspective of food, right, comes to the United States, whether via immigration or um, via force, right, when we think about the African-American experience, um, that there's some amount of adaptation and change and fusion that happens when that cuisine or dish or recipe gets to a new place. Some of the ingredients might not be available, some of the crops might not grow. Um, and so even as you know, individuals are trying to recreate right, the recipes, dishes, flavors um, of their heritage, of their past, of their family, sometimes little changes have to happen for those sorts of structural reasons, right? Like they're just not available. But Oftentimes, um, the, the, some of the first or sort of accessible businesses, right, for immigrants throughout the 20th century and, of course, in the 21st is to open a restaurant, right, to bring your culinary knowledge and expertise um, and open a business, right, and be a small business owner in the United States and try and live the American dream, right, to the extent that it's possible, actually accessible. And so in those moments, the audience for that food isn't just your family, right? Who sort of is already um, educated and has tasted it before, right? Is trying to sort of bring back food memories or experiences. You might be, right, in the position of trying to market uh, this food to um, a consumer base who isn't familiar with the flavors or doesn't know the ingredients. And so sometimes in food history and then even contemporarily, there are these moments um, of adaptation and change um, for a recipe to suit a local palate, right, or local demands. And so sometimes we end up with some interesting things, right? Like we could point to an example like chop suey, for example, um, or so many Chinese American dishes, right? Where it's General Tso's chicken, or, right? There's an amazing food documentary that you should all watch if you haven't, right? Trying to chase who in the world was General Tso, right? And like, what is this dish? Um, and so some of those, right, are adaptations that happen, right, to appease or to feel palatable, right, to local tastes. And then sometimes, right, those consumers of restaurants, right, are, are loyal and want to learn, and, right, and can, uh, you know, work towards something else. So I think those are two ways, right, that like things actually happen. But then there's also this very slippery concept of authenticity itself. Okay. And so authenticity, I think I love the way um, that Jonathan Gold, right, famed food writer at the LA Times, right, who we lost a few years ago, who was an incredible, incredible food writer. And so I was in a food workshop with him once, and he described food authenticity, right, as something that doesn't exist and is also the most meaningful thing there is. <laughs> that it is both of these things. I think another way um, that Krishna Duray at NYU, I've heard him explain food authenticity, um, is that it is authentic to whom, right? Yeah. And then yeah. each of us has our own food authenticity, right? Whether it's the way our yeah. mother made it or our grandmother made it or our favorite street vendor made it or our favorite restaurateur made it, right? There are all these different ways that we personally, right, define and identify what is authentic. But there has also been really good research. Uh, Sarah Kay, right, was a grad student at NYU, and she did this whole analysis of how the word authentic gets used when white people write reviews on Yelp. And so authentic is often this way um, uh, of sort of reinforcing a racial hierarchy, right? Of like white people being able to say, this is authentic Korean, this is authentic Chinese, this is authentic Vietnamese food. So it's often um, of these cuisines, right? That are viewed as non-white, um, that are viewed as sort of whether they're marked as immigrant or ethnic, um, that there is this racial dynamic and how authentic can be marshaled in those ways. Um, that isn't doing positive work, right? So I think authenticity can be so meaningful. We can tell really amazing stories around the concept of authenticity, but it could also be used, right, to maintain hierarchies as well. 
And that's not to mention that authentic is also like a marketing tool, right? Like to be able to say something is authentic, right? It's a big part of food advertising, marketing um, in that element too. So I've given you right a mini lecture. There is no easy answer. What do you think? <laughs> it's so fascinating because again and again, all of your comments can, can be related to so many different disciplines. And when I think about media literacy and your question, your comment that of authenticity, it makes me think of who is speaking to whom about what that classic communication formula and if the who are white people on Yelp speaking to a generic audience of they don't know who the audience is it's just you know people who read Yelp um and what are they talking about they're 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 deciding what's authentic based on their palette their history their understanding and so again to just keep drawing that through it's really interesting and also the idea of food as a message so when we think about media literacy, who created this message? We always ask, who created it? Um, and, and what are they doing to get my attention? And when we apply that to food, it sort of just uh, really blows your mind when you think about, okay, so who's creating it? Are they are they authentically whatever uh, they're, they're representing in terms of the culinary style? And then what are they doing to get my attention? Whether it's, as you noted, the food competition show, it's no longer instructive, or as Kelly noted in, in her questions, just during, we, we, we all needed and received a different kind of media messaging around food during the lockdown. It's really interesting. Oh, definitely. And I think your gesture to attention is so important now in our digital economy, right? Mm -hmm. That if um, any of our listeners, you know, here with us aren't familiar with the idea of the attention economy, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that our attention, right? Our um, attentive, right? Investment with content is something that is relatively scarce right? And incredibly valuable, right? In the media moment that we live in. So there's sort of two big takeaways there. One, it makes it so that media content is often created uh, to get our attention, right? So this is where clickbait headlines come from. This is where content intended, right? To incite outrage comes from, right? That that's what draws us in. Um, and so that's one element of it, right? That we see content that intends to bring us in that way, right? Because all it is seeking is our attention. It doesn't really care if it educates us or inspires us or informs us. It just needs our attention, right? So that the machine keeps running. And then the other piece that I use, right? Like media literacy and also sort of like the way we use media as a, a needed literacy, that none of these social media apps are actually free when we think about the investment of our attention. Sure, we don't pay to download Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or Snap, right? right, to our phones, but when we give them our attention, right, we are investing a really valuable resource in them every single time, right, we click the app, every second of our time that we give to them, um, and so some of that time, right, like my colleague Zenia and I co-edited this book about food Instagram, not to just be solely critical, right, of all these social media apps, um, that there are some elements, right, of how we engage with each other and with food on Instagram that can build community, that can provide space for community organizing, space for community support, um, as well as ways to have a voice, right, to, pu to push back, right, against um, those in power who aren't listening. Um, so I don't think, you know, that as social media, Instagram in particular, right, is a net negative. I think there are tons of positive things that come with it. But this element of attention is sometimes we give up too willingly or that we don't think about critically as a part of our own, you know, food media diet, if you will. Yes, and in, indeed, I often tell my students and in my book write about um, go on a media diet and think about, you know, your clicks and, and shares and likes and reposts and posts and um, all of it, they're, they're incredibly valuable and they are, um, your attention monetized. Yes. And reason and that the, yeah, there's a reason that all, all these apps, social media apps are free because your attention is paying for the advertisers. Absolutely. Um, 
No, I see a couple of my students in the participant list, like Palka, Allison, maybe there's a couple of others, right? Like they're spending this whole second half of the semester, right? Reflecting on their media diet, right? What do we read and what do we consume on social media? How do we think about advertising? What's, what's our TV and film? Um, that the, um, the framework of a diet, right? Of what are we consuming um, to think about critically um, is an important element of it. And I think what's interesting with both food and you know, these sort of these traditional media forms is that we're not just consumers and we're not just aspiring to be critical consumers, uh, but we're producers, right? That when we cook, right, we create food, um, when we develop new recipes or if we get a recipe wrong, right? Like we're creating, right? Something different that we're food producers. Um, and then as food media content producers, right? When we make our own posts or write our own stories or write our own reviews on Yelp, right? That we are food media producers as well and that we can do that critically and thoughtfully in important ways. Could you please put up uh, question number three in our poll. This is uh, the question, when it comes to food, Instagram or TikTok, uh, do you a, just look at the photos and video or post your own photos and video or both? I love this. So this is exactly what we were talking about, right? Are you just a consumer, right? That you just look at the photos and video or you're more passive in your consumption? Um, or are you also a producer, right? Are you creating your own photos and videos? And so I think one of the important concepts that Zenia and I theorize, you know, through the Food Instagram book um, is about Instagram ability, right? This idea that Instagram itself sort of set and codified a set of aesthetics expectations that whatever we would post on Instagram had to be beautiful and curated, right? Maybe even better looking than it would have been in real life. And so for food, that creates these really high expectations, right? For what our food photos are going to look like. Um, it's a fair amount about like lighting and staging and photographic techniques and how we edit everything, right? To look really beautiful. And so in my food media class, I have my students create their own food Instagram accounts. And when I taught that course during the pandemic, they were like, how can we do this? Like, we can't go to restaurants. Like, there is no beautiful food, right? Like, everything is getting delivered to my dorm room in a styrofoam container. Like, how can I do this assignment? That there was this, right, that only beautiful food, right, lives on food Instagram. Um, that this power of Instagram ability, right, to demand and shape what content is appropriate and what's deemed aesthetically worthy um, is really interesting. And so we see TikTok, right, kind of... Um, continuing in a similar trajectory that on Instagram, there is this sort of shift, right, where younger users in particular sort of push back against that notion of Instagram ability, where they want to have ugly food, right, and real food, and there's sort of this anti-food porn, right, that's pushing back against these sort of luscious images. And so TikTok, at first, right, had this slightly more amateur, right, sort of camera work that it wasn't supposed to look, you know, quite as slick as Instagram. Um, and so I think as it continues to change and evolve, right? Some of it's becoming a lot more sort of professional um, and sort of it's editing and the music and um, it's losing some of its sort of its humor and its edge. It'll be really interesting to see how TikTok continues to develop. Because um, in interesting ways, it's kind of outpaced Instagram, right? Like as the app of the moment, right? It really is a conversation about TikTok made all the more vibrant and interesting as we think about its regulation and accept accessibility and, you know, privacy issues in the United States in particular. Killer. Um, and good for Kelly, right? Don't use Instagram or TikTok. You, you stick with those other food media forms. Ah, so let's see, the majority, right? 68% of you are just consumers, right? We're there to look at the photos and videos. Uh, none of us would just be producers. Uh, and then a third of you, right? Doing both. That's really interesting to me. Um, amongst my students, um, there might be even more who would identify in this, you know, I just consume, right? That I'm okay. not producing, I'm not posting. Um, that I think that the difference is, right? They sort of make fun of me as an old millennial, right? Like posting every day, like it's way too much content. Like they would Beautiful. post just the real high points, right? The very, very special moments make it onto the grid. Maybe they'd put things into their Instagram stories more often. Um, and similarly to TikTok, right? They're gonna consume TikTok a lot more than they're gonna produce. But that I can relate to. I've never made a TikTok, but I consume a lot of them. So do, is, is food on socials 
uh, a, a fairly uniquely 35 and under phenomenon. Can you talk about the generational aspect of this? Yeah. And are, once again, are we talking about um, uh, more binaries there mm -hmm. when it comes to the socials? Yes. So I think the trends we tend to see, right, is that an app will start with the youth and then, right, it, it tends to get, right, like more and more people. Um, and so, you know, Facebook being sort of our first big example, right, starts with college students and then becomes everyone, right, that at this moment, right, we would think of Facebook as perhaps the most age diverse um, and, you know, the, the largest presence globally as well, right, of people who have Facebook accounts, that this would still be the largest app, um, but would skew older, right? There would be far fewer young people. Um, there wouldn't be a lot of young people who are only on Facebook, right, compared to some of these other apps. Um, and so similarly, right, like TikTok five years ago, six years ago. Um, thank you, Miriam. No worries. So glad you thank could you, be Miriam. here. Um, that, you know, TikTok before the pandemic, right, did skew much younger, right? Tweens, high school students, college students. Um, and then the content as well, right, was uh, a bit different, right? That it was focusing more on sort of dances and songs and sort of the things that it originated with, right, before, uh, you know, brightly, uh, you know, merges and becomes TikTok. Um, but with the pandemic, right, a much more age diverse, uh, you know, group of folks signs up, you know, for folks who were impacted of, you know, working at home, right, plenty of people, right, in the restaurant world, my husband is a physical therapist, right, continue to go to work the same, just under dangerous conditions, right, um, so acknowledging we all had very different pandemic experiences, but for folks whose life shifted into the home, media consumption skyrockets, right? So people who are willing to um, subscribe to multiple streaming platforms, right? Have more and more content to consume, right? We saw all of those um, sort of rates increase and then signups for TikTok was pretty similar, um, that that was when their user base, you know, changes. So it would be much more diverse um, age-wise than it was previously. Um, and so, I think there's the perception that it still skews younger and that I think early adopters tend to continue to be young. Uh, but I think the consumption, particularly in that passive way, right, is much more diverse than we think. Um, and that, you know, the desire to look at and consume and be part of interesting food content isn't something that's owned by the under 35 demographic. Speaking of the under 35 demographic, I would love to post our next question because I think it's also a very generational one. Um, and that is when you look for a recipe, which are you most likely to use? Yes, I love this one. One of my, I was just this weekend, my, my son in college texted me and said, do you have grandma's molasses cookie recipe? And I was looking through her ancient cookbook with the handwritten recipe cards. I love those, yeah. Um, and uh, and she would write on each one who gave her the recipe, and there's many familiar names. And it was just this lovely um, history of family friends and church potlucks, and you know, just uh, there is a lot again. The intersectionality of food and what you have tapped into is so interesting to me. Um, so our choices are handwritten recipe cards, cookbook, Google, Instagram, TikTok, food blog. And uh, again, in the chat, feel free yeah, folks if you're missing something that um, is your number one way to find a recipe, like make it up with whatever you have in your pantry. You get to put that to, you can ad lib it. Yes, so excited to see. Yes, I would like this to is ask most you, likely, right? Okay. Of us might have others. I do have a quick, uh, while, while folks are filling that in, I'd really like to ask you um, some of your favorites. Do you have a favorite food movie? Oh, there's so many. I did a really interesting podcast called Historians of the Movie, where we talk about chef, um, which is John Favreau's um, sort of fun one. So that's one that you could hear me talking about. Okay. Um, I do have a soft spot for Julie and Julia, um, though I quite love the YouTube edit that's like just the Julia Child part of it. <laughs> um, that like Beryl Streep is just kind of lovely and how she did that. Um, Tempopo is one of my favorites. That's a Japanese film from the late 1980s. 
1980s. If you could only teach one food film, like it gets at everything, right? Like love, family, sex, war, a global perspective, like it really covers everything. Like there's so can you much. Spell that for us. So yes, I can put Temple Po in the uh, in the chat. It's a it's great. a great one. And so our independent movie theater um, closed in Providence when I was there getting my PhD. Um, and so they had this movie poster for when it was re-released. So it's up on my wall in my office at home. It's like really colorful and you know, all this ramen. It's really, really beautiful. I love that one. Um, what other ones do I love, love, love and watch lots? I actually, one that's recent that um, it didn't get as much buzz. I watched one called Delicious um, that's in France, sort of at the rise of the restaurant and sort of the moments in the French Revolution where um, there's individual autonomy and the idea that like every eater, right, should get to have a good meal, that it shouldn't just be um, for the world of court and for um, for the affluent. And I think it's not quite historically accurate, so you don't get upset about that, but it is such a beautiful film, not just the food, but like the staging of every shot. These beautiful outdoor spaces where they set the table. Um, that was probably one of the most recent ones that I saw that I thought was really beautiful and wouldn't mind watching again. Um, and I will also have two unexpected choices. Um, Nicolas Cage was in Pig, um, which is about um, a chef. Um, and, and if you have presumptions about Nicolas Cage, you would think it isn't good, but it's amazing. Like I would watch it eight times. Like it's really, really well done. And I thought that was really great. Um, a new say you drink men woman is also really wonderful. And then the retelling um, as towards tea and soup are both really beautiful. I agree. I like you drink men woman a little bit better, um, but they're both really wonderful. I totally, totally agree with that one. Yeah. Um, but pig and then um, good fellas. I always point that one out, right? Like there's there's actually so much literature, right? Of like food film and food study scholars writing about um, sort of the Italian gangster film as a subgenre and thinking about the role of food um, and how those men relate to one another and how they relate to society as they relate to their families. Um, all those scenes in prison where they're cooking um, are just so wonderful. Like where they're slicing the garlic with little, little razor blades and like itty bitty tiny sheets. Um, and then like the time and the, you know, intensity um, you know cooking the sauce in that final scene as the FBI is circling um that it's really lovely yes uh yes um I see Natasha saying ratatouille um so historians at the movies is this really fun group of historians who watch a movie every Sunday night and then they live tweet uh you know as they watch it from a historical perspective but also from a viewer perspective and so when oh, I co-hosted ratatouille was my choice and so that's also a really wonderful food film the highest grossing right sort of um these food films for the whole family that's a really good one and Jackie saying good burger Harold and Kumar go to White Castle like less food but like lots to dive into no those are all fun movies. my favorite movie ending is at the good uh the big night then that's a food yes movie. oh I my goodness ending no I love big night right like Stanley Tucci has become right like such a food phenomenal mm -hmm. figure right later in his career but that's always right he always had this commitment to food and storytelling around food no a quieter film was a smaller film but I love it very much it's a great oh, one Google for the win yeah by a big margin that's really interesting just a little bit, right? Like a big drop, right? To those of us who are turning to a cookbook, whether a favorite one or a particular recipe. And then just a few of us, right? To a particular food blog or those handwritten recipe cards. And then interestingly, none of us going to Instagram or TikTok. Um, so if we were um, a much younger group, there's been really interesting work around, um, you know, young folks, Gen Z, going to sort of Instagram and TikTok and treating them like Google, right? The idea of like searching for content from them. Um, so that's um, an interesting piece too. Oh, Jackie's saying Mystic Pizza. I love those dueling scenes with of lobster right that like lobster with the family right it's just this like affordable you go fish it but then like to go right to the sort of fine dining space with that more affluent family and then lobster right means something totally different it has a completely different class signifier attached to it um right that's not even about the pizza but i've always liked that element of it as well chocola as well yeah rachel that's a great one i love that one um i actually don't know white palace i will have to look up that one i'm assuming that's susan sarandon but no i will look that one up See, now everyone can just go watch food movies for the next like month and a half, right? You have so many, so many recommendations. Thank you, Nathan, for this interesting question. Has the evolution of where people discover new recipes 
had a cultural effect on the types of food we eat, the ways in which we prepare them, share them, or any other shifts in our cultural experiences with food. Yeah. Where we're finding the recipes, how does it affect sort of the trickle down of everything else that comes after that? We find mm -hmm. it in then what? So I think as our data shows from our own sample size, right? Like I think this does reflect the trend overall um, of people turning to Google, right? Mm -hmm. To find the recipe. Um, and then depending upon which search results come up highest, right? Which we know isn't necessarily because it's the best recipe, right? Like there are reasons, right? For how things come up higher in the search. Um, and then interesting to think um, if this is a recipe that comes from a website where it counts the number of reviews or where individual users, right? Can give a recipe a number of stars. Then we tend to engage with the recipe the same way we do when we're shopping for something on Amazon, right? Where with many, many options available to us, we find ourselves depending upon this quantifiable feeling, right? That this is the best one, right? All these people used it, it worked for them, it's gonna work for me, this is the best one, right? That there's this sense to it. Um, but we know from Amazon, right? How many of those reviews are fake and how we know how complicated, right? This actual quantification of it is. Um, so I think there's, there's this one element, right? Of like, you're just going out into this vast source of information, right? Trying to find one good recipe that other people are somehow telling you, right? This will work. So I think it's interesting, right? Like we talked about America's Test Kitchen, right? Or something like Cook's Illustrated, right? That these are recipes that like really have been tested, right? To go back to Julia Child as well, right? Like as much as I like love her persona and how much she was just herself, I also really respect her like intellectual rigor of how she tested those recipes so hard, right? She wanted to make sure they would work for American cooks, that they would work for any American cook. Um, and so there's a lot of junk recipes online, right? Where you are not getting something that has been that rigorously tested. And so to turn to, right, one of those tried and true cookbooks um, where everything has been, right, truly rigorously tested. It's interesting how that didn't show up very high, right, in our patterns. Um, so that's one thing, right? This idea of like, does this work? How is it ranked? How is it a part of this, you know, vast sphere? Um, but also this idea, right? That you could go to a YouTube channel or to someone's Instagram account, right? And be able to explore not just a particular recipe, but that chef and their history and their story, particularly, right? If they're teaching you how to cook something from their culture that's quite different from your own that you've never explored, um, that food can be, right? This journey into understanding other ways of being and moving through the world. And so in that way, there can be this really interesting exchange um, that can sometimes be amplified by these different media forms. It can sometimes be flattened um, depending upon how we're engaging with them. And the last thing that I will say um, is that, right, we've heard, you know, for what, 20 years, print is dead, right? And that the book is dying and, you know, as an author, right, with a life full of books um, that makes you want to cry. But that was never that has never turned out to be the case for cookbooks, right? Cookbook publishing, cookbook sales are as hardy as ever, even if, right, they are not the thing that we are turning to for our recipe for dinner. Um, that these are objects that we like to collect. These are objects that say something about us by us owning them, by us having them in our home on display, right? As we think about this idea of foodie culture and of class status and what food means and all of these these many different ways um, that cookbooks, right, still exist and people are still buying cookbooks. And we're also fascinated, right, when we were doing the Instagram book to see these examples of influencers, right, who were in part growing their following on social media in the hopes, right, of gaining access to traditional media, like a TV show or a cookbook deal, that there's still this really interesting flow between media old and new. Um, and so I'm not sure I fully answered the question, but I hope I planted some seeds for how we think about how I think where this question is going is really important. That as we make our search for a recipe more transactional and quick and expecting that it has lots of reviews and that's how we know it's good and worthwhile is very different than turning to the cookbook that your grandmother used or her individual recipe cards or to be gifted someone's recipe, right? That they can say, oh, this will always work on a Wednesday night and everyone will eat it and the recipes will be great the next, you know, their, their uh, leftovers will be great the next day, right? That 
there's something different, right, in what is produced and everything around the food. If just the recipe is all we need and all we want, we're missing out on a lot of other stuff. I love this. The whole, it's just fascinating to me. Every, what these, when you give a full robust answer like that, how, again, so much of media literacy and news literacy comes, it comes into it because of this idea of, I teach all the time in, in journalism classes and in news literacy and my global media literacy class, look at the sources, yes. look at the sourcing. It's, you know, is, is it fake news? And I'm thinking, is it a fake recipe? Is it, you know, so you're telling me, you know, source the recipe, who, who, who's giving it to you? How do you know they're any good? It's like yeah. when I'll ask the waiter, oh, which do you think is better, this dish or that dish, as if we have the same palate, you know, it's like, that's, it's, it's that ridiculous. And so your observation of, of if you really care about food, and if you really care about, um, making uh, food that tastes good and that tastes good to you or your family, um, then sourcing of a recipe is hugely important. And, and doing, I always say, investigate the stories or the news questions um, that you really care about, because we don't have time to do all of it. We don't have time yeah. to do all that sleuthing. Um, yeah. And you also make a really interesting point uh, about the context collapse of social media. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're smashing that context. And usually we think about ourselves in all these different social groups and social media puts all of our followers and all of our people. Um, and then similarly, who we're following, there's also a context collapse there that I'm, I'm saying context. Yes, I get it. Um, yeah. And just for the listeners, it's, yes. I wanted to make clear that it's not content, but and so that, that's interesting as well, because if you're a food blogger or a, a food marketer, you know, your audience is, is incredibly broad and diverse. And so, and you're, and you're needing to market to them in all these really different, unique ways. Cheryl has an interesting point here on the PBS shows. Oh, yes, Marcus Samuelson. Yep, I would totally um, recommend his content, his restaurant, his recipes, his, his, uh, his restaurants. Uh, Misha Collins, ah, a new twist on a previous 50s road trip to regional food influences on America. That's interesting, right? Like, how do we combine the sort of like nostalgic that sometimes has that very dominant identity laid over it? Like, how do we think about um, that kind of an environment in a different way, from a different perspective? That would be really fun. Thanks for that, Cheryl. Um, uh, Meg, right, we didn't talk about Mark Bittman. I definitely have his How to Cook Everything right on top of my fridge, right, with Cooks Illustrated, right? Like, it's one of those um, where there's going to be some helpful, helpful things. Um, thinking, ah, someone pointing to Rachel Ray. And so I find her such an interesting figure, like people either kind of like Guy Fieri, either like love or hate her. Um, but she was someone who was still trying to teach people how to cook, right? And was quite unapologetic about, uh, you know, making it quick and convenient and tasty and, you know, relatively healthy, right? They were mostly recipes that you could make on a weeknight and feed to a family and everyone would like it. You could feel okay about it. Um, then she's an interesting figure who like hasn't been given her due sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, although I don't like love her talk show as much as I did like you know sort of her old school you know 30 minute meal stuff um and then Jackie usually ah uh, she didn't really cook she threw things together right she did open boxes and cans and I think she also like she came from catering and so she often was like hesitant to ever call herself a chef right she's like I'm just a cook like she played that role in a very different way um Someone who I have thought about though is like someone like Sandra Lee, right? Like Sandra Lee, semi homemade, where there is no promises, right? Of like making something from scratch or, you know, trying to appeal to a foodie sort of sensibility of, you know, the artisanal or the craft made or, you know, the slow, you know, heritage recipe. Like she was all about, right? Like opening, you know, boxes and, you know, shoving things together. Um, I have the historical ones here, right? The like Poppy Cannon, right? And the can opener cookbook and all of the sequels to that. And then Peg. Bracken's I Hate to Cook cookbook, which was also these sort of quick recipes, right? She didn't actually hate to cook. She was a fine cook. But the idea that that message, right, maybe for so many of us here, right, like, yeah, so Angie's saying the bear. Yes, I taught the bear in my class, loved the bear. Um, it was more, more good stuff. Absolutely. Um, of teaching, oh, sorry, go ahead, please. 
Oh, I was just going to say, so many of us love to cook, right? And maybe want to spend lots of time in the kitchen. Um, But there's a whole subgenre of these cookbooks, right? That is how to make it quick, how to make it easier, um, how to make the labor of cooking when you're also working or doing lots of other things. Um, You know, I recently, you know, went up for tenure, which is, you know, this like long, you know, years long sort of endeavor. And along the way, like the extra energy to like really like cooking sort of dwindled away. So I wrote an essay trying to get to the bottom of that of like, oh my goodness, right? And this person whose whole life, you know, revolves around food and my love of cooking sort of dried up as I put so much of myself into my career. And so I think it's another point, right? Of thinking about our tensions around food, right? We can love it and still have these very ambivalent feelings about it. And so, you know, I'm still unpacking those. Anu's question sort of ties into this. Um, you mentioned that your students create a food social media page and you post regular, have them post regularly. Yeah. And Anu would like to know how in your teaching you navigate the public private dynamic of food. Yes. So one thing is that they don't have to have their own name on it if they in any way feel um, self-conscious or that their privacy is being impinged upon to like truly be public about their food that they're eating, that they're cooking. Um, And so I think that's one piece of it. Um, But the powerful part of it is that we use a class hashtag so that all of our images, right, sort together, knit together, that you can find all of us. And so this most recent time that I taught food media, Um, I taught it with one of my colleagues who's at a university in Taipei, Taiwan, and they also used the same hashtag. So my students in Tulsa, Oklahoma, got to learn alongside these students in Taipei to be able to see, you know, all this amazing street food, the restaurant culture, what the students were making at home. And they similarly, right, got to see what my students here in the United States and particularly, right, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, were eating on a daily basis. And so we all, right, read from the Food Instagram book, we knew that part of what we were sharing, right, was an edited version of the truth, right? It was perhaps the the best version of our food lives that we chose to share with one another. But even knowing that, to be able to have this cross-cultural learning experience of what our food lives were like as we took this class together in different classrooms on opposite sides of the world, that it was incredibly meaningful, right? That a hashtag was what made that possible for us to be able to learn and share and grow together that way. But I've also taught a version of that class where the students posted so much and there was so much engagement that food bloggers started to colonize our hashtag, right? Like it was a hashtag for our class, right? And they started putting it on their food content, right? So that's part of the game that, you know, food uh, content producers on Instagram and other social media platforms are always playing, right? Of like, what hashtags are you including so that you get noticed, so you can work the algorithm, so you can get that attention, right? Which is so valuable. Um, So those are a couple of points that I would bring up there. Dr. Contoy, have you noticed in your work, um, especially when when you were working on that food Instagram book, have we seen... um, a a decrease in the quality of the postings because of that race for attention because uh, you know it's the black box of algorithms and if you're a food influencer you don't you don't really know um, all the secrets that are going to make you boost in um, you know in someone's feed so I'm curious if you think it has um, had a negative or neutralizing effect in any way on the quality of Um, the food dialogue and the food media we're getting on socials. Yes. So I think I would say two things of the content that's being produced. Um, One, that I think this expectation, right, that Instagrammability put in place, that there actually isn't sort of a lesser quality aesthetically, right? Like if anything that increased and amplified, right, sort of the expectations of what, if you were trying to be a content producer, right, of what the images had to look like. But I think one of our favorite chapters in the book came from two French scholars um, who are analyzing hashtag food porn, right? And so food porn uh, brings to mind, right, uh, beautiful images of food that are sort of seductive, right? There's movement, right? There's oozing chocolate sauce or an oozing egg yolk, right? Like there's this ooey gooeyness that um, immediately like incites our senses and is sort of um, 
you know, drawing us to this sort of sensual experience. So we certainly theorize that, like, what does the porn mean? What is this connection to sex and sexuality? Um, but food porn also, right, just like visually, like a logo, right, represents um, and explains, right, a particular style of food photography that became very popular on food Instagram. And so hashtag food porn is totally meaningless now, right? People attach it to any image of food. And so as <laughs> As an actual, you know, meaningful sorting mechanism, hashtag food porn doesn't tell us anything. And so that's a really interesting thing that we see happen, um, that hashtags can become quite meaningless as they're applied in sort of these nonsensical ways. Um, but again, from this effort to sort of game the algorithm, to get that attention, to be able to break through. Um, and as you say, right, like none of these, none of these apps, right, have been forthcoming of like exactly, right, how the algorithms work and what you need to do. Um, but I think too, to think about sort of community and, you know, content producers supporting one another, um, that they're definitely focused you know, in, as they were trying to figure out pieces of what makes the algorithm work, right? Like, I'll like your stuff if you like mine, I'll repost it, right? Like there are these ways where communities of practice um, sort of come about from trying to understand and influence the algorithm so that your content can be seen, that that can be a community practice as much as it's an individual, right? Sort of pursuit for visibility. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to post a uh... Another question for our participants, it's number five. When you look for trustworthy nutritional information, which are you most likely to consult? Yeah, so are you gonna look at the food package or nutrition label yourself? Are you gonna consult a dietitian? Are you reading the newspaper following the health column? Do you read a blog from an influencer? Are you gonna to go to the peer reviewed scientific journal that's behind a paywall, right? Are you able to get to that? Or the historical precedent, right? What did my family eat? What did a culture eat 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 2000 years ago? Um, but I think history can be an interesting teacher here as well when we think about what we know about nutrition. Um, and so in my own life, right, like my first master's degree was in public health nutrition, right? So I was interested in this question um, of how do we help people on that population level, right? To eat well so they can live joyfully, right? Like that was something that I wanted to help to promote. Um, but since then, right, like my work is more interested in like the meaning that nutrition takes on in culture. So in my first book, right, like I'm interested, like how does protein come to be understood as masculine right how does you know the grams of protein something contains or the idea that steak and meat right provide protein right have this gendered sense and of course it's also classed and raced and you know has national understandings the work that i'm doing now on plant-based meat right gets at all these questions as well um and so thinking about how a nutrient, right, whether it's fat that becomes demonized or protein, which is always understood as good, um, or, you know, antioxidants or, you know, all of these different parts of, you know, nutrition science, how do they come to take on cultural meaning? How do they circulate in culture, including on food packaging and in food advertising and, you know, within all these other media spaces of where we talk about nutrition, um, that it's not, you know, know, um, purely objective, right? This idea of science, right? Human beings create science. We bring into it our own biases. Um, and so none of this, unfortunately, right, is as easy and simple as it sounds. And so nutrition science has been a space that I've been interested in, right, since that first beginning um, of what nutrition means to us. As in your book, you mentioned powerful yogurt. And yeah, the the, the fascinating discussion about protein as masculine and, um, and that's a fascinating chapter. It was such a like fun, but also infuriating product to write about, right? Like it's so strongly went after men. Um, it literally, right? Y'all who've never seen it, perhaps like it's not on grocery store shelves anymore, but the packaging was humongous. It's big, hard plastic. And then it literally had six pack abs chiseled into the side, right? Like it was trying to embody a particular masculinity at every single step from its black packaging to its 20 grams of protein per serving. Like it was, it was totally bonkers. But for those of you, right? Like you're taking control of your own search for 
trustworthy nutrition information. We're looking at that nutrition label, right? Where we can sort of decipher, right? Like what's actually in the product. Um, and then we probably should have put this into two different choices, right? The food package itself could actually be kind of confusing, right? Of like the messages that might be there, um, how the, the color imagery, font and topography choices, right? Like all of that um, can encourage us to think particular things about um, the healthiness or the not healthiness, right? Of a particular uh, particular uh, product. Um, some of us knowing, right? That a dietitian would be the health professional that you could turn to, right? For support with your nutritional health. Um, and some of us, right? Having access to the, the peer reviewed science, right? To make sure we really understand what's going on. Um, and I often, right? I find like great comfort Comfort in this idea of historical precedent, right? Particularly when low carb became such a sensation, right? We still have keto, right? All this idea that we shouldn't be having carbohydrates. So when we think about the role of of wheat and of rice, right? And of so many, you know, grains that have been a part of, you know, society's ways of eating for a very, very, very long time. Mm -hmm. um, that we don't have to be, we don't have to worry, right? Being swayed back and forth by the most recent scientific finding from an observational study, right? When we know our history too, uh, that there's always that that long view that we can take of what we're eating too. Um, Norstein is totally right, right? That, that American exceptionalism that goes hand in hand with that obsession with protein is definitely something I've written about that I can't stop thinking about. I'm still trying to unpack that piece of it. Sweet. Uh, unfortunately, our nutritionist and our participants had to leave, but I would have loved to um, to hear the most commonly asked questions of nutritionists today, particularly um, from folks who use a lot of social media and get a lot of information from online. Yeah. I really wanted to get to our last question before we have to yes. wrap up. Um, it's our last poll question, folks, and please jump in. This is uh, people who really know their food, who are a gourmet are called foodies. Is this group of people characterized by other demographic elements? And let us know um, how you think about foodies and how you would define them um, in terms of their income, uh, their educational background, um, race, ethnicity, culture. Um, are they from a particular area in the world? Um, are they city folks or not necessarily apologies a little technical difficulty here the poll question coming in a little bit well wait just a second no worries we have this interesting insight from angie from angie. the perspective of being a master culinary mixologist um, of how consumers will pay such close attention to a nutritional label um, but they won't turn right that same attention to spirit labels um, that they'll just follow an influencer's recommendation or buying the bottle because it's pretty right? This idea. And so I do, I feel quite torn about this, that to really understand a nutrition label, right? You kind of have to take introduction to nutrition, right? Like it's kind of complicated, right? What are all these different fats? Um, and so I think this was something that came out in the research for hard seltzers that compared to um, wine, right? Where there's some knowledge that you as a consumer sort of have to have to know what you're ordering and what you're tasting and to know what a tannin is, right? Like all these elements of it, an informed connoisseur, um, that that had started, right? To become a part of beer culture as well, um, to be able to think really critically about how it was produced and what type it was and all the different flavors. Um, but, and so I think sometimes people feel sort of overwhelmed, right? That they're not expert in sort of uh, their knowledge about spirits and alcohol. And so to just just buy one, the label looks nice, um, can be this way to sort of opt out of that. But also to not deny, right, that the packaging is hugely influential, right? We have really good studies showing, um, particularly, right, with wine and beer and spirits, um, but also with food, right, that the packaging can really influence consumer choice in really strong ways. Um, and so that's place really on the shelves in the grocery store, yes. Yes. Oh, Valerie's reminding us of Bebet's Feast. I also totally recommend that one. It might be a little bit harder to find, um, but incredible film. Um, 
um, uh, cooking one right incredibly beautiful life changing meal um, for for a group a group of eaters. I really enjoy that one as well. Um, there's also interesting comments about you know do we read and use the comments on recipe sites right where they're useful where they're not. Um, the comments on recipe sites are different than you know on news articles right where things you know might be quite unpleasant that the idea that the comments are as a part to be helpful, right? Like, oh, I used it with this and it still worked, or I changed it and this made it better. Um, that is really interesting. Thank you. Oh, Sue Ellen, yes, uh, talking, oh, so your question, right? Who fits into the category of foodie? Well, we'd love to hear what y'all's perceptions are, right? Like we talked about Guy Fieri and the idea that his fans might eschew that label, right? Might not be comfortable being identified as a foodie. That uh, has definitely been interesting academic work, right, of like who we think a foodie is. But I am similarly, right, very excited to hear what our, what our, um, what our, our audience, all of our friends here tonight think a foodie is. You know, it's interesting when you invite people to dinner, for example, one of your fears is, oh, no, they're a foodie. <laughs> Like now the pressure's on. They they really are going. No, well I'm the worst, right? I have a degree in dietitian and another yeah. in gastronomy, so I'm a professional foodie and a professional. Like I'm just like no, I'll eat anything. Like thank you for cooking. What a labor to give to someone. Um, that cooking's a lot of work, right? To bring people into our homes and to feed them. Um, I'm ridiculously lucky. Uh, one of my roles here at the University of Tulsa is as faculty in residence, and so I live in a dorm um, with you know dozens and dozens and dozens of students, and so I have them in big groups over for a family meal but I am so blessed that our catering team comes and helps like I couldn't cook the equivalent of a Thanksgiving dinner right multiple times a year as much as I love them I couldn't do it <laughs> it's a, a huge labor um, so I think as we think about right the people who feed us right whether it's gender dynamics within our own homes whether it's dynamics of citizenship and class and race and we think about who's a part of our food system the protections they have or not as they grow our food, pick our food, slaughter our food, um, help transport our food, right? That sometimes the good food movement, right? Thought about the animals that feed us, the ingredients, the land, and hasn't given that same attention to the people, right? Who feed us all along the way. And so we are so grateful um, for um, all of those contributions and recognize ongoing inequities there too, right? This is a place for us to have a voice to make a better food world for all of us and a food media system to represent it, tell all those stories. So many questions I wanted to ask about the, 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 the for example, eggs and the food chain and supplies and our, our, our how, how the food um, chain and, and inventory affects um, food media and and there's we could go on and on and uh, it's been so fascinating to talk with you and um, some wonderful questions from yes. participants. Thank you so much, everybody, for your attention and and energy and in, in in engaging with us. Absolutely. Is there anything finally that you'd like to say, Dr. Contoy, before we sign off? Oh, just a big thank you that this was so much fun. It was such an honor to be the, the virtual keynote for this year's Foodway Symposium. I am, um, have so much respect and joy for everything that this symposium is about. I hope everyone who's here turns out to all of the events in person. I wish I could be there myself later this week. Um, thank you so much for your attention, your questions, your media recommendations. I hope this was a good evening for everyone. Thank you Sue Ellen to be in conversation with me um, and to Christina and Rachel for all your efforts to organize this and to invite both of us to be part of us part of this this was really wonderful thank you all thank you well thank you both Dr. Kantua and Sue Ellen what a lovely conversation and thanks everybody for participating uh, this is all being recorded and we will share it on our website um, I'm going to put our website here in the chat box one more time. It has the details for Saturday, April 15th. Uh, we are going to continue this uh, event on Saturday. And um, speaking of, of next year, kind of in, in talking about uh, the different cultural themes next year, we're, we will be focusing on African Heritage Food Waste Symposium. So, uh, Please stay tuned for more information about 2024. And uh, thank you for being part of this community. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. There will be a little 
uh, evaluation when we sign off. If you if you could please fill it out, uh, we really appreciate the feedback. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Dr. Contoy. Thank you. Bye, everyone.